Hello and welcome everyone to this very exciting webinar, World's Premiere, Will JWST Reveal Earth 2.0? I'm Paul Sutter, an astrophysicist at the Institute for Advanced Computational Science at Stony Brook University, and your host and moderator today. I'm uh, joining me on our panel, our exoplanet scientists extraordinaire. Very excited to introduce them. We have Nestor Espinoza at the Space Telescope Science Institute, Elizabeth Matthews from the University of Geneva, and Caprice Phillips of the Ohio State University. These astronomers will be among the first to use the new telescope to revolutionize the study of distant worlds, just as the Hubble and Spitzer space telescopes have uncovered fascinating details about the plethora of worlds beyond our solar system. So too will JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, seek to answer some of astronomy's most pressing questions, like are there other solar systems that look like ours, and is Earth the only planet capable of supporting life? This event is sponsored and organized by EOS, Science News by AGU. EOS published a special issue about exoplanets in August, including an article that inspired this event, about what the James Webb Space Telescope is expected to learn about distant worlds. Make sure you check out that issue and their other exoplanet content on eos.org. Folks, I don't want to waste any time. I want to get right into the questions and give these wonderful scientists an opportunity to speak and hear their interesting thoughts about what the James Webb will deliver. I've, I'm going to get us started. I've got some questions ready to go for them, but really, I want you to lead this. We've got an hour. Their time is yours. It is their brains for you to pick. So please, please, please use the Q&A function in the chat uh, in the webinar right now so that you can submit your questions. I will field those questions over to the panelists, get them your, your questions, and we will get to hear their answer. So please, I encourage you throughout this entire hour, send those questions in. Panelists, thank you so much. Thank you so much for devoting your time today and joining us to talk about uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, which which is might actually launch. We've only been waiting like a decade for it, but it might actually launch in less than a couple months. Uh, let's go around and, and meet each of the panelists and get their opinions on, on, on what you hope. What are your biggest hopes and dreams for the James Webb? Uh, Elizabeth, let's start with you. What's your biggest hopes and dreams when it comes to the James Webb Space Telescope? Well, what a big question. <laughs> yeah, so so my research focuses mainly on um, planets that we can directly detect. So planets that are fairly far away from their star and typically are pretty big. We're only normally sensitive to planets that are a Jupiter mass or more. Um, but with James Webb, we'll be able to push those limits down quite a lot potentially. So I'm interested to see for some of the systems that we know about, whether there's more planets that are hiding that we haven't been able to detect so far. And then for the planets that we already know about, we're gonna be able to learn so much more about their, their atmospheres as well, which is gonna be really cool. Got it, got it. Uh, Nestor, what about you? What are your biggest hopes and dreams when it comes to the James Webb? So I have to pick one. I have like many of them. Oh, sorry, yeah. we got a whole hour. We can, we can go through. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I have high hopes for really understanding exoplanet atmospheres. Right now, we've only scratched the surface of what it's the makeup around these planets that we've discovered around other stars, all the way from small rocky planets up to giant planets like the ones we have in the solar system. So GWST is really, really going to look at them now. Like we're gonna be able to get like spectral features, you know, even for the smallest exoplanets, maybe even for some of the most exciting ones that might are, are in the habitable zones of their stars. So really picking up one of them is just too hard for me. Uh, but I think it's definitely going to revolutionize what we know about these distant worlds. That has me super, super excited. <laughs> I bet, I bet. And Caprice, uh, thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Uh, what are your hopes and dreams when it comes to the James Webb specifically? Um, yeah, so I'm a graduate student. I'm a third year at The Ohio State University. So like the research project that I've been working on is seeing whether like JWST might be able to detect like potential biosignatures. 
and like gas drawers, like certain types of exoplanets. So I'm really interested to see if it might be able to detect like ammonia, which is the potential biosignature that I study. So that's kind of like my hopes and dreams. Like even if we don't detect it, like that still tells us something. So I, um, I'm interested to see like into the atmospheres and expanding what we already know from the Hubble Space Telescope. So I kind of sound like a broken record, but really like atmospheres and like spectra and stuff of these like targets, I think are really interesting to see. Following up on that, Caprice, uh, could you share with the audience uh, just just what is a biosignature and, and what the heck is a biosignature doing in a planet's atmosphere? Uh, yeah, so basically like a biosignature could be like an indication of life or some sort of like metabolic like processy. Um, and so like basically I, I, I study it on these type of like planets called like gas drawers, which include like super Earths and many Neptunes. And so they're like these really interesting things that can have like hydrogen based atmospheres. And so they're not kind of found in our solar system, which makes them very interesting. They can have like different atmospheric chemistry. And there's a potential biosignature that like Sarah Seeger first proposed like ammonia in the atmosphere of like nitrogen and hydrogen dominated atmospheres. And so the idea is that they could be like microbial life, it could be like breaking apart the bonds and using the energy for like metabolic processes and like eventually enough may like accumulate into the atmosphere to detectable levels. And that's what we're trying to see if JWST might be able to detect. And so we can start to like see if it sees it and then start to rule out like abiotic processes and like these reactions like don't happen below a certain temperature. You need habitable pressures and, and temperatures for it to happen. So like just kind of trying to put detections into context and different like types of things that could be causing the signature that we might see is something that like I study for example. Got it, got it. Uh, and Nestor, could we take a step back and talk about the James Webb itself? Uh, could you briefly walk us through the mission timeline, what the instrument is and looks like, what, what are the wavelengths? Just, just fill us in on this fantastic telescope. Right, yeah, I'd love to. Um, well, the Webb mission, it's the one of the biggest human technology, technological advances, right? We're sending this tennis court sized big telescope up to 1.5 million kilometers from Earth, which is totally insane because it has to be like, it's like a transformer, you know, it, it goes like very packed and it has to open up. So that kind of technology we're doing for the first time, which is pretty exciting on its own. But then Webb is going to be observing these colors of light that we cannot see, right? We, we typically look in the optical, just the colors that you're seeing right now. Uh, but in the infrared, that's really what, where, where, you know, the, the main signatures of all these molecules that we all love, like ammonia, the like Caprice was just talking about, water, methane, uh, carbon dioxide, which is, you know, we see in the planets in our solar system. That's where their signatures really are. Uh, so Webb is going to be looking at a huge wavelength range, at a huge range of colors that we have not explored before. Uh, so that's that's the beauty of the of the whole observatory. It has four instruments to do all this, and they look at the different particular ranges of these wavelength range. So when you you know when you put them all together, like there was a TV series back in the time when you would put rings together and Captain Planet would come out of it. This is a very similar thing uh, with the different instruments. You can join the entire picture of what these other worlds look like. So it's a beautiful instrument, huge advancement. And I'm, again, really pumped to see it happened. Oh, I, I can tell your, your enthusiasm is absolutely infectious. I'm, I'm getting excited myself. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, this is primarily an infrared telescope. Why, why is it infrared? What, what, why this particular wavelength range? Well, so, so one of the things that's interesting, well, so let me start that again. Um, from the Earth, if we want to build telescopes on the Earth, it's a lot easier, obviously, because once you've built it, you can go back, you can fix it, you can upgrade it. Whereas space telescopes are pretty technologically complicated and you have to get it right first time, but you don't have to look through the atmosphere. And a lot of the wavelengths that James Webb is going to give us access to are wavelengths that we can't look at with ground-based telescopes because the atmosphere absorbs all of that light. And that's particularly relevant when you think about things like the biosignatures as well, because obviously it's difficult to study an element that we have a lot of in our own atmosphere when we're looking at another exoplanet atmosphere. So that range gives us a, a, huge, um, a huge amount of information that we just can't get from the Earth that we can only get with space telescopes, um, which is gonna be really valuable in, 
understanding these atmospheres. And there's a ton of chemistry that we can see in those um, in those wavelengths as well. A ton of molecules that have interesting emission lines and things that we can see uh, in the mid infrared. Yeah, yeah, we've heard about water vapor and methane. Are there any other interesting uh, chemical compounds that we can spot in an atmosphere? I'm interested in in silicate clouds as well. Um, so again, thinking of these more more massive planets, planets a bit like Jupiter that um, that we'll be able to directly detect. We believe these have complicated silicate clouds in them, especially when they're very young because they're quite warm. Um, but we'll be able to directly detect features from those silicate clouds as well and confirm that the clouds that we think are there really, really are there and maybe look at um, how thick the cloud coverage is on those planets, for example, as well. Got it, got it. Uh, I, and I know I mentioned broadly infrared. We do have a question from the guests here. Uh, Ivalice Castillo is asking, anyone off the top of your head, does anyone know the precise wavelength range of James Webb? I know it. Oh. I mean, it, it's, it's dependent on the instrument. So there's four instruments. Um, near spec, which is one of the instruments, goes all the way point, from 0.6. It can go up to five microns. Um, so this is, this is 10 to the minus six. Uh, meters. Um, nearest goes all the way from 0.6 as well, all the way up to three microns. Uh, near cam can actually map between one to three as well microns. And MIRI, which is the really the one that goes beyond all these other instruments. So we call near, near spec, nearest, and near cam the, the near infrared. They're still infrared in my heart, but they're the near ones. Uh, but MIRI is the one that is going to be really, really far off. It goes from five microns, all, can all go all the way to 30 microns, depending on which instrument you use. So it's absolutely fantastic. So you, need, you see the, the wavelength ranges are very large. So overall, GWST can go from 0.6 to 30 microns. So to give you a comparison, HST in the infrared can only go to about like 0.7, like more or less. And, that, that, and that's it. That's a narrow window in the infrared. But this thing, this new machine can really, really go over the board with it. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> uh, Caprice, uh, what are some biosignatures that James Webb won't be able to find? Like, like, is this telescope going to find life on another planet conclusively? Um, so that's kind of a, a tricky question because like, for example, I keep going back to ammonia because that's like the, the molecule that I study, but like if we were to like detect ammonia, for example, like you can't just like straight away say like we found it, like we found like a process, like we found life, like you have to like put the context for like whatever biosignature or like biosignature, like indicating molecule that you might Fine, you have to put it into context like of the planet like there goes things into like the interior modeling um for the planet and like different things like you need to talk to biologists like chemists like like all these like different people which i think is like really cool because it brings in such like interdisciplinary fields so i can't like for sure say like what it won't be able to detect we just have to like wait and see but i know like if you were to detect like a, a potential biosignature like ammonia for example you have to put it into context with the type of planet and start doing like interior modeling and start talking to a bunch of different people to see if it makes sense for the planet and to also rule out like abiotic processes that might have brought that molecule to the planet in the first place so it's like really exciting Exciting. like if you detect it and then the steps afterwards I think are like exciting as well so god I got what's also very exciting Elizabeth is the fact that James Webb has a coronagraph and can do some direct imaging what is a coronagraph how does that work and and what will it be able to see that we haven't been able to see before yeah so a, a coronagraph is the, the simple version is that you can imagine it almost like a little black spot that just blocks out the light from the star. So then we can see all the faint stuff near the star. The engineering is a little bit more <laughs> complicated than that, but that's certainly the principle that you're, that you're physically blocking out the star and then you can see the other things. So that gives us the, the potential to image both planets and also debris disks or protoplanetary disks. So basically anything around the star that's emitting light and we can typically get down to a million or 10 million times fainter than the star so we can get these really deep images of um planets and dust that are near the star and then learn about the planet atmospheres and the structure of the disk and how the planet and the disk might be interacting as well 
God, again, that that's that's yeah. is absolutely revolutionary. That's so exciting. Following up on that, Elizabeth, Eva Lisa has a question. Will James Webb be able to capture details on exoplanet surfaces, or is it really limited to, to atmospheres in, in the surrounding system? So we we can't look at the surfaces directly. Um, and it's important to bear in mind when we when we the resolution that we have, even an entire planet is smaller than a single pixel on the on the detector. So we really just have a point source um, for, for a planet um, that we're trying to image. What we can do is try and make inferences about what the, I think about Jupiter-like planets, so they don't really have a surface. We can make some inferences about what the, um, the surface might be like. So we can do things like monitoring whether the planet brightness varies over time. And then we can use that to infer whether there's light and dark patches on the surface of the planet, but we can never directly see the surface. We can just make inferences about what that might look like based on the light curve of the planet. Got what kind of inferences about the surface can we make? And, and any of the other panelists, feel free to jump in. Nesta, do you want to go first? <laughs> yes, I wanted to add this because this, this, yeah. this goes with a, pro with a program that I'm leading. Uh, with a ton of other folks here uh, in, in, well, over the world, really, in that what you can do for some of these exoplanets um, is that some of them might be so heavily bombarded, especially the rocky ones, might be so heavily bombarded by radiation from their stars that you might reasonably expect that their atmospheres have blown up and they're like bare rocks, basically in which their surfaces are really exposed. So what we can do, not with direct imaging, which is the technique that Elizabeth was, was mentioning, but um, you can use other techniques to actually uh, detect photons from these surfaces. You can actually detect light from these surfaces and see how they vary as a function of the different colors. And it turns out that different kinds of rocks, like for example, uh, in the solar system, we have a wide range of surfaces, like for example, Mercury has one type of, of sur surface, uh, ultramafic rock, we call it. Venus and Mars, for instance, have more of this kind of basaltic rock. So they, they have different, they respond different to light. And we can actually detect those responses with GeoDSD. And we have a program actually focusing on trying to get this done for one so-called lava world. It's like heavily bombarded. We believe that maybe the atmosphere is blown out and we will be able to see the surface. So you can map the properties of surfaces of worlds out there still. So you can, you know, you can make your way through it, although it's kind of difficult, but you, you can't, you, we might be able to constrain some surfaces out there, which is pretty cool, I think. That's so cool. That really is cool. Um, you mentioned a team, and, and the three of, three of you will be using data from the James Webb Space Telescope, but presumably you're not the only three. We have a question from Megan Cox. What kind of team does it take to run the telescope, interpret the data that the James Webb collects? How many people and what are their jobs? How does this all work? Um, well, just kind of touching on that question a bit, like some of the people that I wrote this paper with, like collaborators, they do like photochemical, like modeling, and there are people that do like interior, like modeling to like put the like data, like in the context and stuff. So I think like I was kind of going back to like how people like in a disciplinary and like work on a bunch of different stuff. So just like working with people who are experts in the thing and like people who are experts like on that instrument and stuff. So I think that's kind of like my interpretation for what I know, like for the question from, from my experience. So. Yeah, the, the formation of those kind of things is also very interesting. It, uh, it might happen randomly, it might happen you stump up on someone at a conference or doing a talk, you receive an email. And then you say like, well, you know, I have this idea. Do you think you can help me out? And then this team got form, gets formed. It can include people as Caprice was saying, like people that do theory, people that do data analysis and just put them all together uh, and you start working on it. Uh, so their job, they're typically, typically astronomers and physicists um, that, that work with you uh, on your team, but they come though in, in our case as well, it, it comes from everywhere in the, around the world. I have, we have in our team, it's people from Europe, it's people from here in the US uh, that we got together and, and decided to go for the ideas that we had. We, in particular in our team, we formed like a collaboration in which we got together uh, like a year and a half ago before the proposals were sent in, we got together back in Bern in Switzerland. And then we shared the ideas with each other and we say, okay, let's decide on 
the 10 best ideas that we have and let's go for them. Uh, and that's how it worked in our case. So it's, it's a bit different in every other team, but more or less on average, that's how it works. And in reality, it's, it's pretty fun to get new members as well, get new ideas flowing and everything. It's amazing. Very cool. Related to that, Elizabeth, we have a question here from Christian Walls. Could you please explain the top three exosolar systems in wondering if that's even a word, that are prioritized. How are these systems chosen? Uh, how, what are the other systems chosen to observe and how long does an observation take? I can have a go. Um, so I think, I think the phrase would be exoplanet systems and then the, the exosolar, well, the solar system is the one with the sun in it and the exoplanet systems are all the other ones. I think any astronomer you ask will have a different answer for what their, the top three are, because there's so many different science questions that we're trying to think about. Even within this call, like I'm thinking about Jupiter-sized planets, Nestor was talking about his lava-sized planets, and then Caprice is thinking more about planets that might have life. Um, so we'll all have different systems that we might say are our favorite. Um, the, the way that the process works, that the telescope decides which systems to observe is that there's an open call so anyone who wants to can write a proposal and we've all gone away and done that and written three pages of science and then three pages of technical demonstration that we know how, how the telescope works and what the data will look like and demonstrating that the data will do the thing we've promised we'll do in the science justification. And then an independent group goes through all of those proposals and picks the ones that they think are the most um, interesting and the most uh, technically sound. And those are the ones that get observed. So we were, I guess we were all lucky enough to have proposals selected in that um, process. Um, and I think the last, the last question was about how long the observations take, which is again, very dependent on what your science goals are, what kind of thing you're trying to do. Um, so I can comment perhaps on, on my program where we're just trying to look at one planet, we're trying to directly detect a planet for the first time. And for that program, we only need to spend I think three and a half hours or so uh, looking at the system itself. But then we also need to look at another system to um, get reference data that we can use to calibrate our data. And we also have some time that it takes to move the telescope around and to set up the right observing modes and everything. So my program ends up being about 14 hours in total to detect one planet, hopefully. <laughs> but it really depends on, on what the science goal is. I think there's programs that are much bigger and much smaller than that as well. Uh, Nestor and Caprice, how long are your planned observing programs? Oh, I can go first. Yeah. Um, well, mine started in the order of 15 hours as well. So they're more or less the same. And in this case, they're much more boring than Elizabeth's in that it's just staring at the same star for like 10 hours because <laughs> we, we, they have short periods and, and we want to capture the, the entire duration of the events that we're looking for. So yeah, that, that's in, in our case. So I'm just a grad student, so I don't have like a proposed program, but like some of the systems that um interested in study like that for like in the paper, like you'd have to like wait till like it transits and stuff. So like a few hours, I guess, would be like optimal to see, like to build to stack the transits upon each other to get like a better detection is from what I looked at for like the theory side of it. Got it, got it. Uh, Nestor, in the EOS article, you said the very first exoplanetary observations to be made by James Webb are going to be a big jump into the known unknown. Uh, could you tell us what you meant by that? I meant the known unknown, which is like, uh, we, we know that our understanding of exoplanets is incomplete. And, and we've tested that phrasing of this several times. Whenever we've looked at different system, We've gotten the data and we've seen stuff that we were like, mm, okay, we don't know what's going on or we have to go back to the whiteboard and do calculations a little bit again to update our models. And uh, GWST is gonna be that test once again. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we have, I mean, we all have wonderful ideas on, on and exciting ideas on what we're gonna look up. I mean, you, you heard Caprice speaking about biosignatures, Elizabeth about detecting new planets, uh, these lava worlds that I was just talking about. So we have ideas on what we know today, but GWST and whenever any new instrument opens up to the universe, you always detect stuff that you were not expecting. And I'm, I can bet you whatever you want that this is exactly what's gonna happen with GWST. So for give you, to give you a, a, a practical example, this lava world uh, proposal that we have on, uh, 
the idea of detecting like the surfaces, it's based on the surfaces that we know in the solar system. And that's like a, a sample size of what? Seven, eight, nine, depending. If you count the moons, maybe you have a little more. But that's like very solar system centric. We don't know how this really goes in, in extrasolar planets, like in planets that form around other stars. And this particular star that, it, that this lava world is orbiting, it's actually very different from the sun. It's very active, like it has uh, uh, like a ton of spots going in. And it's like very chaotic. Like it, it, it's flux varies by a lot every few days, which is very different to the sun. If we lived in that, in that star, we'll be, we will be literally fried because the, the amount of radiation that these stars push into the planet, it's totally different. So this is the first time that we're gonna be exploring this high radiation levels on rocky planets. So I, I can tell you what we know now, and this is the proposal that we put, like what we're expecting, but we know that we're jumping into a tons of unknowns, that this is the first time that we wanna have the opportunity to look into these kind of planets. So we're gonna be uncovering stuff that it's not in our minds right now. That's a good, very, very good place to be. That said, some of the targets that James Webb will initially uh, focus on are already very well studied exoplanets. Why are we going after those and studying those instead of looking at sun-like stars and searching for small rocky habitable planets around them? Um, I guess I'll try to take this one. So like, like one of the planets that study like Hubble Space Telescope is like K218b. It's like in the Hubble zone. And they like think that they like detect like water vapor, for example. That's like a very like small like wavelength region. And like with JWST, like you're going to be able to like look more like more coverage and stuff. So it's like we've like studied this planet and people have done like interior modeling from it for like mass and radius measurements. But like we want to expand like what we know because like we know like stuff about it, but like compared to like the wavelength coverage for like JWST, like we can learn so much more from it. So like, even though we've like studied things before, it's, it's like exciting to like expand the knowledge and like, it might be easier for like smaller, like planets that orbit like smaller stars to like be able to study them in transit as opposed to like a larger star and then it can be like too bright and might overwhelm the detectors and things like that. So people look to like planets that orbit around like M dwarfs or smaller cooler type stars, like for example, compared to like a sunlight. Sorry. Yeah, complementing Capri's answer, which I think it's excellent. That, that basically explains most of it. There's an instrumental component as well to it, which is that we don't exactly know how the GWC instruments are gonna respond. I mean, within the web team, we've done the best we have we can to characterize the instruments with, I mean, I have so much data on my laptop right now and on, on the servers that it's, it's, uh, it's overwhelming. But really the final test to all instruments is gonna be on sky. So you really want to go for the planets that you know more or less what you're expecting or that you expect, like even in the worst case scenario, you will get a signature of what you're trying to look for uh, to test for this first cycle. But then the most risky proposals are gonna appear next year in the next cycle. So these proposals uh, cycles that Elizabeth was mentioning before, they happen uh, kind of yearly or their they're, they're hope is to happen for it to happen yearly. Um, and then, as, you, as we go further in time, as we know better how the web instrument responds and how they act, what the noise floors are, the, most, the more risky proposals are gonna start to appear. And the more risky ones are looking, say, at small planets in the habitable zone of their stars, because those are hard to detect. You have to observe the events many, many times and stack them to build up the signal to noise. This is something that Caprice also explained before. Um, so doing that in the very first run is, is too risky because you will, you will use like all the GWC time and maybe you won't, you won't have the expected noise floors, for instance, like the noise levels that you were expecting. So that's why also that it's very, this very first cycle is so important because it will set the stage for the next set of proposals that are going to come in the next cycle. Just how many astronomers are competing for time on James Webb here? How competitive? And and let's say I'm I'm a random member of the public. Can I get time on James Webb? If you can write a good enough science justification, then why not? So it really is. Um, anyone has the option to write one of these documents. There's lots of rules about how long it has to be and how it has to be formatted and everything. But anyone who wants to can write one of those. And the process is actually anonymized as well. So the people that are picking the best proposals don't know 
whether it was written by a big name professor or whether it was written by some member of the public. Um, that being said, I think it would be pretty difficult to write a proposal without um, help and advice from the people that really know how the instrument works. So certainly on my team, I brought in experts when I was designing the proposal who are able to run simulations of what the data is going to look like and help me demonstrate that the science we're suggesting is actually going to work. <laughs> um, in terms of how many people want to um, observe with the telescope, I think in the first year they got four times as many proposals as they had time to observe. So four years worth of science ideas, but only one year worth of telescope time that they could give out. Um, which is really sad as well, because it means that there's loads of really good proposals that, that weren't selected, loads of really good science projects that aren't going to be able to be done. And I would expect that there's only going to be more and more competition as, as we move on to later cycles, as people get more familiar with how the, how the telescope is working and what it's able to do for exoplanets and develop the community expertise to be able to really make the most of the telescope. So it's pretty competitive. <laughs> but. And there's more to the James Webb than just exoplanets. Um, yeah. uh, there are other science goals, uh, like studying the first stars and galaxies. Do all the science interests uh, that, that utilize the James Webb, do they all compete against each other, or are there separate buckets for each general kind of, of science area? I can go on that one. So how, do, how this works, uh, it works on a, a community-led uh, push on what percentage of allocation it's done to the different science uh, science topics. Um, so depending on how many proposals are sent for say exoplanets, that that ratio is tried to be maintained for the proposals that are accepted and allocated. So it's it's all pressure dependent. Like if everyone in the community wants to do first galaxies, like 90% of them, well, probably 90% of the accepted proposals will go to first galaxies. But that's not the case and it's very divided. Exoplanets, it's around the 20% of the, of, the, of the time. So that means that, you know, 20% of the time that people were proposing was focused on exoplanets as well. So it's very popular, but yes, as you say, it is not the only uh, science topic for web. Uh, we have a question here from Jason Durr. Are there any means by which one might discover using the James Webb that an atmosphere one wouldn't expect to have life uh, might actually have life? If, if we just see an atmosphere and we don't fully understand what's going on in that atmosphere, could we possibly deduce that there is, is life on that planet? Or no, maybe not, we can't, we don't know. What you mentioned, Nestor, about the known unknowns, we really are going into the unknown. What is the process, uh, both as an individual scientist and as a member of this collaboration, a user of the James Webb, uh, for all of you, what happens when you encounter the unexpected? You make an observation and you really don't understand what's going on. How do all three of you react? Well, yeah, I mean, go ahead, Nestor, let's start with you. Right. We go back to the whiteboard and we ask like theoreticians and people that work on chemical rates, like would, you know, this, this abundance of water compared to this abundance of methane makes sense. And, you know, the answer might be no, but the, the problem with life that I see, at least from uh, the perspective of, of chemical networks, is that there's many unknowns on the kind of uh, environment that these atmospheres are at. Like there's little information from the lab even at these pressures, at these temperatures for these molecules that sometimes might trick you into processes that you don't know. So I think the best example for this that I have from the top of my head is like Titan. Um, so Titan is this moon that we all love. It's full of you know, methane and, and other things like lakes of methane, which is kind of weird, but that, that's just how na nature works. But people have, have had a hard time trying to figure out before actually going in situ to that moon, uh, have having, we're having a hard time figuring out what the atmosphere looks like it looks like. Uh, that was kind of a bit of jumping into the unknown. Uh, and most of those questions were revealed once, once you went in situ. And, and the answer to that was come, came from many places, came from exploring the entire atmosphere in its entirety, more than photons that are released at the, at the top of the atmosphere. It, come, it came also from lab measurements, uh, from reactions that were not thought of before. 
So I wonder if that same thing is going to happen with life. And, and I will defer to Capris on this because she's been working on this, but that might be an issue as well on that. Yeah, and I, I also think, I feel like I sound like a broken record, but I also think like, if like if you find something unexpected or maybe if you find like what you're like looking for you have to like go through like these like rigorous like processes to like kind of you, like ammonia it could be brought from like comets like ammonia eyes it could be like secondary atmospheres that like produced ammonia there's like all these things that you need to like start to look at and then you might need to like go back and like maybe get more time to confirm that that's actually like what you uh saw like in the first place so it's like it it brings in like this interdisciplinary interdisciplinary field and you have to put the like detection like into really into um context but i don't know it's all like very exciting and then but we don't know like like these planets like super earths and like sub neptunes like we're still trying to figure out like how their atmospheres like even look like in the first place so that's like an unknown that we're like jumping like and like into like for example so it's all like very exciting but i think it's like interesting that like we don't know it might be something that we find that we're like what is this i mean i'm just a grad student so i'd like run to my advisor and be like help like type of thing so that's just kind of like my like outtake on it uh and elizabeth ha- how do you deal with the unexpected? My my instinctive reaction was way more pest- pessimistic than Nesta's. My immediate thought was, oh no, what if I've made a mistake? That's how I normally react when the data looks weird. And then we've got to just go back and really check carefully that we've done all the work on the data correctly. Um, so for my program, we're actually going to have two teams independently try and reduce the data and hopefully get the same thing out at the end. And then that'll give us more confidence that we that we haven't got some some mistake in our calculation that we really have seen something unexpected and then we'll go talk to the theorists on the team and see if they can explain what's going on and then if no one can explain it then we can then we'll publish that then we'll tell the community about that result and say look this planet is weird and we don't know why and we need to we need to study this kind of planet in more detail so are there other planets that maybe a similar in a similar environment to this planet that we can look at as well and see whether they're also weird in the same way in which case there's a some part of physics that we don't understand that's changing the way planets look relative to what we expected or if we do a survey do we find that this is the only one that's really weird in that way and then that that has a different implication is again that means that we have a specific oddball planet but most of the planets are behaving the way we expected but certainly it opens up more opportunities to do interesting science if we find unexpected things to try and work out what's going on. And that's really exciting as well. For sure. The the unexpected results are always yeah. the <laughs> fun ones. Uh, there's this saying that most advances in science don't come from Eureka, but from, oh, that's weird. Uh, so uh, speaking of weird stuff, uh, let's bring things back closer to home. We have a question from Jeffrey Arrington. Will the James Webb be able to spot or it, it, can it spot and is even targeted to spot things like the hypothesized planet 10 or, or planet nine or whatever it's called or other Kuiper belt or Oort cloud objects in our own solar system? Yeah, I, I, can, I can go into that. Um, so there is hope for Julius to do, to do a lot of solar system science. Uh, I'm not sure for the prospects of planet nine, this planet that are hypothetically is happening here. And, and the issue is the following, uh, we're doing like a survey like that. The problem is that for planet nine, which is this hypothesized planet uh, that could be in our solar system, is the problem is that we don't know where it is. And GeoGST is not uh, what, they, what we typically call within the community a survey mission in that you can just send it and look like a, a very large portion of the sky. This is typically GWST is like a characterization machine mostly, which is like, you know, there's a region of, that's interesting and then you point GWST to that and you get like extreme detail and rich detail on that. So I think the GWST might not be the right machine for Planet 9, uh, but there's other telescopes, upcoming ones like the Roman uh, that could be very useful for that. Um, for that particular search. But studying solar system objects, Jill just is gonna, going to be do that for known solar system objects, definitely. And there's some proposals happening on that. I think also if, if someone were able to find Planet Nine from the ground within the next five years, then it would be awesome to point 
JWST at Planet Nine as well and learn more about it. But as Nessa said, you, it's just too expensive to try and find Planet Nine with the JWST. Uh, let's turn the conversation uh, away from existing planets to to potential planets of uh, fully not fully formed systems, protoplanetary systems. What are we trying to learn about these kinds of systems, and how will the James Webb help? Yeah, one of the one of the cool avenues is trying to to see the planets forming in real time. So with with Alma, for example, from the ground. We know quite a lot about the disks and people might have seen the there's some very famous alma images where you can see rings of dust and gas with gaps in between them so the inference is that perhaps there's a planet in that gap um and that applies also when we have kind of spiral arms and things more complicated structures are believed to be caused by planets so i know there's a couple of programs that are going to try and directly detect the planets or the protoplanets really that have been inferred to be there based on the disk structure in some of these systems. And then also there's some programs that are gonna look at the, the disk material itself and look at the chemistry and the grain distribution and what, what stuff is in the disk that will go on to form planets, which we can use to infer what the planetary cores might be made of, for example. If I might also compliment Elizabeth, yeah. I, there's a topic that I'm super interesting in, interested as well, which is uh, the so-called debris disks, which are like the end so after you form the planets, there's some leftover material that, you know, there's no trash truck that can come and take it off. So it's still there. It, it can be in the form of like solids, in the form of gas. And that can actually inform you a lot of what's going on in this, in this planetary, in this already formed planetary systems, all the way from say exocomets that might be leaving traces of gas around that you can detect with GWST. That's gonna be, there's a proposal uh, by Isabel Rogillo here at, at SDSCI and the Space Telescope that's doing exactly that, like measuring the residual material from this planet formation process. Uh, so, you know, you'll be able, as Elizabeth said, you can go out all the way before and even after the planet formation process. I think that's beautiful. You can look at all the time scale of the processes, which is amazing on its own. That's one of the reasons I really like direct imaging as well, because you can see everything in the system. If you've got more than one planet, you can see them at the same time. And if you've got dust or gas, you can directly see it at the same time as well, which is really cool. <laughs> yeah, how will the James Webb complement other instruments like the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array or ALMA? So ALMA is a, is a radio um, instrument, a millimeter and radio instrument. So it's looking at much, much longer wavelengths again than James Webb will do. Um, and in the case of, of disks, for example, the, the grain size that you're sensitive to is the same as the wavelength that you're, you're looking at. So um, it, the, you can look from the optical all the way out to the radio and you're accessing different parts of the disk, different grains within the disk and able to study those different um, grains. And we see this, we can compare, for example, optical observations to ALMA observations as well. And you see the dust is much more scattered out in the optical observations, because we're looking at much smaller grains of um, grains of dust, which are much more mobile, which can be blown around much more easily. Whereas in the radio, we're looking at the, 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 bigger, the bigger structures, kind of the core of the disk almost. And James Webb will be kind of somewhere in between as well. So we'll get access to a different part of the disk and also access to different chemistry. So we'll be able to learn about, we'll, we'll get a more complete picture of the disks by combining all, all the different data we can, essentially. Uh, Caprice, are there any complementary telescopes or observation programs that, that you will use in combination with the James Webb data? Oh, I, I feel like I just kind of like work with like theory because like things haven't launched yet. But like OSU is actually um, a founding member of this like telescope. It's like the Twinkle Space Telescope. Um, and it goes from like, I think like 0 0.4 to like 4.5. Like, I think it would be like really interesting because like we talked a lot about like high risk like type like planets. And so like looking at like some of these targets, like maybe with like Twinkle, like for example, and like kind of looking into the atmospheres and like maybe like 
using that data to like like oh let's try to look at this with like JWST like for example so I think like just like complementary like things like that would be like interesting to like follow up space on things you might see with like smaller telescopes and things like that so Kale, uh, uh, Caprice, uh, you mentioned this is all theoretical because it hasn't launched yet. There have been significant delays, of, of, over a decade of delays when it comes to launching this telescope. Uh, you're a graduate student. Um, you weren't even an undergrad when, when James Webb was supposed to launch. So, so how have these delays uh, uh, fed into your own career and your own interests? I mean, like, I, like, I'm just like a junior scientist. So like, honestly, like by time, like, like data may be coming out or like, they may be like more observing proposals. Like I'll be like, hopefully like further, like into like my, sorry, my notifications are going off. I don't know how to turn it off. Sorry, but like, um, it's like to like, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Like, as I like get into my career, like a postdoc and stuff, like actually like having access to like data and like working with people at like a future like job or something, I think would be like really interesting to actually like start getting out like this like data and stuff. So it's like, you know, I mean, it's like, I guess it's like stressful for like other people and it's like stressful for like the astronomy community, but like, I don't know, I'm like looking forward to it because I'm like learning, like the more I learn, it's like exciting. I'm like, I actually may know what to do with this stuff as I learn more whatever so I'm not like take your time but I'm like you know I, you know it's exciting type thing so I just kind of my thoughts about it. <laughs> Elizabeth and Nestor same question how have the delays uh, personally affected you? Yeah I, I wouldn't have been able to do my observing program if James Webb had launched all that much sooner because the planet that we're going to be looking at was only discovered in at the end of 2019 so there was the, the presence of a planet in this system had been theorized for quite a long time, but it wasn't until the end of 2019 that they confirmed the mass and the orbit. I say they, a member of my team led a publication where they confirmed the mass and the orbit of this planet. And without that information, we wouldn't have been able to, to write a program to go and look at the planet because it would have been so much harder to say exactly where um, in the system the planet is and how long we need to look at the system to get deep enough to see the planet. So from that point of view, it's kind of nice that it was it was delayed just long enough that this planet could be discovered. And I think that's the case for a lot of the programs um, in the first year, that these are planets that have only been discovered fairly recently. The TESS satellite has also been doing a lot of work to discover new planets that are going to be really great to look at with JWST. And it's kind of nice that the TESS satellite has had three years to find planets before James Webb is launching. So we can look at all those cool planets as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I totally agree with, with Elizabeth's take on most of the proposals are using newer planets. So in terms of the timescales of discovery of the exoplanet field, like the first atmosphere that was detected with uh, HST, it's back in 2005. But by that time, there was only like two, three, like a handful of planets for which you could really do atmospheric characterization. And by... By 2011, which was one of the big dates in which WC was going to launch, we didn't have much more planets. In fact, we only had like a couple like Earth-sized planets that you could really go. But they were, if you look at them in comparison with the number of planets that we know today, and you rank them into which ones are the best for atmospheric characterization, most of the planets in 2011, they all fall like very, very in the bottom of the list. They're not the best. So we've been kind of, it's like a blessing in disguise, but we know it's like, it has been tough for many people in the project and around the world. But in terms of the list of exoplanets that we know today, we have a very, very good set of planets, which are like the best to study exoplanet atmospheres today that we have not had access before. So it, it has been a really interesting take on that. And on a, on a personal level, I mostly work until like the end of my PhD, which was like 2017. I mostly work with ground-based data. So it's not really, I mean, I also work a little bit with space-based data, but I really jumped during my postdoc years into that. Um, so it didn't really affect my science, but I do know that it affected a, a ton of people outside in the community, for sure. Nestor, you, you mentioned the first ex of exoplanet atmosphere measured with the HSD, the Hubble Space Telescope. We have a question here from Asan Asadi. 
How likely is it that James Webb changes our inferences drawn from Hubble's observations of an identical object? Will the James Webb be revisiting some of those same targets and, and what new information is gonna come from that? Yes, uh, a lot. So in terms of, um, if, you, if you could imagine what Hubble have done, I mean, Hubble has done amazing discoveries for exoplanet atmospheres. You want to make, I just want to make that clear. But in terms of the windows that we're looking out here, this is like having a small window on your room right now, which you can see a couple of trees, but then someone comes and you just breaks the wall and you see the entire forest. So that's the kind of changes that we're looking at with GLUSD in terms of the wavelength range and therefore the features that we're gonna be able to do. So yes, GLUSD is gonna be observing some planets for which we have some features already detected with HSD. Uh, but the, the, the amount of information that that's going to bring us is going to be totally revolutionary, I, I would say. It's going to teach us like why clouds form on certain planets. Um, where, when do they appear? Is there like a sequence uh, that's for giant planets? And then for small planets, even do they have atmospheres or not? That's something that HST to this date has not detected an atmosphere in a small planet unambiguously. Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's a fact. But you know, just is, is going to be able to tell us those kind of and, and perform those kind of detections. So it's going to be complete change. Awesome, Caprice. Uh, same question: How will the James Webb uh, inform or update uh, previous observations that you've been working with? I feel like Mister like took all my like ideas. <laughs> so like I, the thing that like first popped like into mind was like clouds so I think it'd be like really interesting to see like like um because some things like you see like may see like a flat like spectrum because there's like a cloud in the way so like looking at like some of those targets like people are like they've already observed like this this like k218b like with um Hubble but like there's some proposals and stuff to like observe it with with um JWST to see if like we can constrain the same about and like abundances of molecules and like different things like that so I think it can like help inform or like confirm like what we've already seen and also like expand like our knowledge, for example, to constrain the amount of stuff like in the atmosphere and also to like give us more insight into like how clouds affect these like detections, like for example, so. Got it. We're, Elizabeth, we are all eagerly awaited, waiting with bated breath, this instrument and the potential of an Earth 2.0. What exactly is in Earth 2.0, how identical to the Earth must it be to be classified as, as 2.0? I think this is another question that you'll get a different answer depending on which astronomer you ask, because it depends a lot what, what, um, what your science question is. Um, so, so for example, if you're really thinking about Earth 2.0 meaning another habitable planet, then there's some some give in terms of what the planet could be like and we don't know exactly what the boundaries of which planets are and aren't habitable even lie often we just mean a planet the same radius and the same mass as earth but i think that's a too large a definition because there's lots of stuff in there that would be very different than Earth. so even venus would be in earth 2.0 if you're just thinking about the radius and the mass um, but really, I think the closer, the better in terms of trying to look for habitability, because like I said, we don't know exactly what the range of planets that might be able to host life would be. So the more similar it is to Earth, the more optimistic we might be that it would be possible to find a life signature or a biosignature there. Uh, and Nestor, what is the, the lifetime of the James Webb? How long can it continue making data and producing results? And, and what do you think the ultimate legacy of the telescope will be? Oh, tough question. Well, in terms of timelines, um, the main mission is supposed to last uh, five years, uh, but it can be extended all, all up to like 10 years, depending on how the launch goes, how we chart, you know, lock into the final orbit that GLUST is gonna have. Um, so it, there's some wiggle room over there. And, you asked, I think your question was the legacy. Was that the word that you, well, I think, I mean, 
this is similar to the state of affairs that we had back when we were looking at the first stars for, for exoplanets. So this was work led by Cecilia Payne back in 1925 uh, at Harvard. And, and she basically did a revolutionary statement that other stars were, oh, well, that, that first of all, that our own star, the sun, was not composed of the same stuff as, as the earth, which was, which was the thinking at the time. At the time, this might sound nuts for us right now, but at the time, people thought that the sun had the same composition as the earth. Um, but then Cecilia Payne made the revolutionary statement that that's, that's, you know, you're all wrong. The reality is that the sun is like an hydrogen ball and it's completely different to what you're expecting. I think we're at, at that point of exoplanet because this is going to be the first time that we'll be going to be looking at these exquisite details with exoplanets. Um, so we're going to be figuring out that not everything is like the solar system. Not everything works like our own Earth sized little ball, blue ball. Not everything works like Jupiter uh, for the giant planets. So I think the standing legacy is going to be like this mind change in terms of mind shift on what how diverse exoplanets really are out there. I mean, I'm convinced that's gonna be the case. Um, it's gonna tell us like where to look at and then other missions are gonna come in the future. Like there's upcoming missions as well to look into exoplanet atmospheres like Ariel by, the, by ESA. And we're about to hear maybe about the future new great observatories here in the US uh, that are really going to go deep into population level looking for earth sized planets and their atmospheres. But GWST is gonna say, set the stage for all of those. Like this is the diversity uh, and that's gonna be one of the big legacies of GWST, like that we are very different or that our, our models are very different from the real data, for instance. So it's, it's gonna be a huge change, I think. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we are almost out of time uh, on this wonderful panel. Uh, before we go, I'd like to go around. Uh, let's start with Caprice. Uh, how can people follow you either on social media and also your, your professional work? Where can people find you online? Oh, Caprice, you are muted. I can't work Zoom even after two years. So I'm on Twitter a lot. So it's just at Caprice Phillips. And there's like a link to like my personal website and a bunch of other stuff about like just how I am as a person in my research. But my main link is like, you can find me on Twitter at Caprice Phillips, so. All right, Nestor, where can people find you online and follow along with your adventures on the James Webb? Sure, um, via Twitter it's N Espinosa P or my personal website where all my info is, uh, it's nestor-espinosa.com. Perfect, and lastly, Elizabeth, where can people follow along with your adventures? Yeah, Twitter is the best place to find me as well. I'm at Liz underscore Matthews, that's L-I-S underscore Matthews. Um, and I think all of our Twitters were linked in the, in the AGU tweets that were advertising the event as well. So we're easy to find from there maybe too. All right. Thank you once again to all the panelists. You were fantastic and absolutely informative. It was fantastic to hear from you. Thank you to all the great questions from all the attendees. And uh, thank you, Kimberly Cartier. She's been in the background. She organized this entire event. Uh, she's there. A big round of applause for Kimberly Cartier for organizing this. And a huge thank you once again to EOS for organizing and sponsoring this event. Make sure you follow them on Twitter at AGU underscore EOS. You can also visit EOS.org and sign up for their weekly newsletter. Thank you again. And let's see what the James Webb will review. Thank you, everyone.